joining me. I'm Mike Balaban, and my guest today is Dr. Eric Cervini. Eric is a prominent and rising young academically trained LGBTQ historian, or maybe queer historian, and we've known each other for a while. When I went to L.A. two months before COVID hit in 2020, we got together at the Abbey Cafe for a drink. We've stayed in touch throughout this period, and then in May, you moderated a panel discussion that Queerty put on for their first gay book club in a, in a video format, and I was on the panel. So this is kind of a reunion for us, but I just wanted to kind of focus on the many different and amazing things that Eric is doing and kind of get his perspective on them. So let's just start back at the beginning. Uh, you grew up in Texas, right? Yes. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you as always. My pleasure. What can you tell us about your upbringing there? I mean, Texas is not the most liberal place now. I can imagine what it was like 25 years ago. It uh, was not uh, 25 years ago uh, any any more liberal than it is now. But that said, I was I was very lucky to grow up close to Austin, Texas, about 30 minutes outside. Which, if anyone has has been before, they know it's it's relatively liberal to the rest of Texas. Uh, it still has elements of it, and I grew up just outside of it. So it was just far enough to see a glimpse of of what a really progressive urban environment could look like. But I was very much a product of the suburbs. And until recently, it was a deep red county. It was Williamson County, but it just recently flipped. Uh, it's it's changed to to a blue county, and and I think there's so many of us that are optimistic about the future of of Texas because of some of these demographic shifts. But to answer your question, back. Growing up there, you know, I was lucky to have a very accepting mother. It was just her and me uh, growing up there and a very progressive one. You know, my very first wedding that I ever went to was a lesbian wedding. And so I think I had an atypical Texan queer childhood. Uh, I still, despite, you know, having a really accepting mother, I still didn't come out until after I left until about two weeks before I started undergrad out of state. You know, I think looking back at that time, I wondered what what took me so long, even though I had a very accepting immediate family, a very progressive one, what took me so long? And I think the reason was that I just didn't have a template for what a happy queer person could look like, and certainly not one in, in Texas. There was only one openly gay uh, student in my high school that I knew of. And, you know, he was perfectly nice guy, but one day he didn't show up at school and we found out he had tried to take his life. I read a study 20, 30 years ago, I think it was in Sweden, about the fact that even though that country is one of the most progressive and earliest to approve same-sex marriage, and and in fact, an integrated society where it's really hard to find a gay bar, people hang out with everyone. The incidence of suicide attempts among questioning and queer youth was as high or higher than in some other places. And the, the moral is, it really isn't so much about your environment as your own view of yourself. And when you're an adolescent, you want to be like everyone else. And being different is difficult no matter what kind of community you grow up in. Right. Exactly. And, you know, I, I just think, you know, if it was that difficult for me to come out despite a relatively accepting environment, I can't imagine how difficult it is for folks who aren't lucky to have that. And so I think every coming out experience, you know, I've heard every coming out is a form of, of a form of trauma, but I think it's also a miracle. It's it takes an incredible amount of bravery even today. Uh, to do that. And I, I don't think we should lose sight of that, even though it's becoming more, quote unquote, acceptable. When did you first begin to recognize that you were different, particularly in terms of being attracted to other boys and, and how challenging was the process of self-acceptance for you? Sure. Well, you know, there's there's two parts of my identity, as I think there is about any queer identity that you know, I had to navigate first is sexual attraction. And then second is gender expression, right? And by gender expression, I don't mean how you identify. I mean, how you perform your gender. 
And very often, and this is something historians have studied for, for decades, is the relationship between those two things. Before it was about sexual attraction, being queer, quote unquote, or a sexual deviant was very often about how you presented yourself and your gender. And so for me, you know, it was much sooner in my life to start to see that I was different when it came to being quote unquote girly, right? Or effeminate, uh, or I know some folks have you know, been traumatized by the word sissy. For me, it was being called girly. You know, I, I recall like, crossing my legs in church and, you know, my mother, bless her heart, saying, hey, don't don't sit like that. Right. That is a form of uh, gender uh, deviation being corrected. And so it was things like that that I started noticing and being, frankly, bullied about before it had anything to do with sexual attraction. I think as time went on, <laughs> I started to realize, oh, you know, I'm much more interested looking at you know, the, the, the boys in this film right. than I am about, about the girls, uh, and, and other forms of media. And so that said, I think what I first discovered about myself being different had to do more with gender expression than, than sexuality, which I think is something that often gets forgotten because of course there's a huge array of, of gender diversity within the LGBTQ plus community. It's interesting because I grew up in a different era. But I also, I, I kind of divide gay men, at least when I was growing up, into two camps, those who could pass and those who couldn't. And that's where the gender expression came in or the gender behavior. Where I grew up, not too dissimilar from where you grew up, but it was even deeper in conservative terrain in the, in the South. If you didn't play sports, you were considered a faggot. And, you know, so I played sports, but I was able to pass and hide and the homophobia was internalized. Nobody gave me much crap. I got called fag once or twice just because that's what people did. But, but they didn't identify and say, oh, he is one. They just were typically boyish, you know, and, 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 and not easy to get along with. But if I hadn't been able to, I would have been bullied mercilessly. And so those are the kind of two camps. And, and that's why you had to confront both of those issues early on. Exactly. And, you know, I, I was lucky not to be called a fag until my late 20s. You know, I think maybe it was because Texas kids just weren't that sophisticated to, to know that word. Uh, the slur that I was called was was girly, which I think also exposes, you know, the misogyny Absolutely. that is the root cause of of so much of, of what we now call homophobia. Um, doesn't have to do with disgust over whom we sleep with. It has to do with how we express our femininity. Right. And, you know, I think that speaks volumes about not just the nature of homophobia, but of, of American society and how so much hatred is rooted in, in both misogyny and also racism for others. Well, they go together hand in hand. There's, there's no way to separate them. And, and, and until we can make it more acceptable to be female, it's going to be hard to make it more acceptable to be homosexual. Exactly. Have you always had an interest in history? And when did your affinity for gay history begin to manifest itself? You know, I did not <laughs> grow up even imagining, contemplating that this would be my future. I thought I would become a lawyer. I thought maybe I would go work in politics. You know, I was even in college, I was interning in Washington, D.C. I loved uh, studying American politics. I was a debater. I really loved politics. And it wasn't until I realized from watching the film Milk, about Harvey Milk, around the time that I was coming out. So I was 18 or 19 years old. And, you know, here I was thinking I, I had a good grasp of American history, American politics. You know, I had had done very well in, in my history and government classes and in, in, in high school. I was taking political science classes at Harvard. But then I watched this film and I realized that this crucial story uh, that every queer and straight person should know in America, and thankfully because of that film, a lot more people do, uh, I had not been taught that. I hadn't been taught it in Texas. And until that point, I hadn't been taught it in college. 
Uh, and so after that initial shock, the next question was, well, what other stories are out there uh, that I haven't been taught and that perhaps nobody knows about, or at least nobody within the general public? Uh, and that's when I when I first stumbled upon uh, the name of Franklin E. Kameny. How many states are you aware I'm not actually include homosexual or LGBTQ history in their curriculum? Is California one? California is one of them. You can count them on one hand. I maybe there are a couple more in the in the in the Northeast. I don't have them off the top of my head, but uh, let's just say it's. These are outliers. I think maybe two or three states have it within the curriculum is at least one that's mandated by the state. And even then, uh, you talk to the teachers within those states, they're not given any guidance about how to actually teach <laughs> these, There's no curriculum. these topics. Yeah. Exactly. There's no, you know, and then of course the, the, the textbooks on American history are dictated by the largest states, one of which is Texas. Which so, are conservative. Exactly. So those textbooks are not going to include it. So teachers are really on their own. And I think that's why I, I try to make a lot of the resources I, I create available freely to, to teachers because there's such a dearth of this this information and guidance. But unfortunately, it's getting more difficult in, in some of these southern states to, to teach these topics. Of course, in Florida, it's outright prohibited. But I, I think it just goes to show how much more important uh, it is for us to be advocating for for this type of education. You know, as someone who grew up and came out in the seventies, it it feels like we're living through Anita Bryant all over again. Oh yeah, you know, oh, yeah, with a much more favorably disposed conservative Supreme Court helping power the movement to curtail our rights. So, you know, it's it's a real battle that we have ahead. Your academic credentials are impeccable. You know, how did you end up in Harvard and then at Cambridge? Well, I didn't have many friends, <laughs> so that <laughs> helped. Um, you know, I didn't play many sports. I didn't do much of anything other than reading, studying, uh, keeping my nose down. And, you know, I think I had a pretty boring high school experience. I had some wonderful friends. And, well, you know, I think a lot of um, uh, young queers who, who overwork themselves and, and excel uh, in academics understand it's partially for many of us because you know we we don't want to confront a part of ourselves that we'd rather keep suppressed so it's much easier for me to to immerse myself in my studies than to you know go to a party and have to contemplate dating a girl right or anything like that um it was a very good way to distract myself was through my studies and hey you know what it it paid off i'm very blessed to have a great experience in in college and grad school, um, and wonderful professors who who allowed me to to take a really unconventional approach. You know, I I went to grad school pursuing my PhD, never intending to be a professor. I always wanted to come back to specifically to LA to to Hollywood to tell these stories because, as I mentioned, you know, it wasn't a class, it wasn't even a book that got me interested in in, in queer history. It was it was cinema. And fortunately, there's a lot more queer content, but there can certainly be even more and even better quality out there. Well, representation is everything, right? Um, exactly. You know, you've already mentioned Frank Kameny, and who most people, even in our community, aren't, aren't aware of. Again, many more are now because of your book. But your book was a Pulitzer Prize nominee and finalist. It's called The Deviant War: The Homosexual Versus the United States of America, and it came out in the middle of COVID. In fact, I, yes. when we met, you were a few months away from publishing it, and I had no idea what was about to happen to you. Frank was informally, I don't know about the father, but a father of modern American LGBTQ rights, and spent almost 20 years of his life fighting for a job that he lost because he'd been, I think, arrested in the bar, I forget the specifics, and never- In get, a bathroom. In a bathroom, in a toilet. Yeah. And never got it back, but it obviously brought a lot of attention to the issue. He got as far as the Supreme Court. He co-founded the Mattachine Society, at least the D.C. branch of it, et cetera, et cetera. How did you become interested in him? I mean, you, again, I understand Milk brought you to the general topic, but how did you specifically find out about him? And, and when you began to write the book, first of all, did you have some idea of this while you were an undergrad or did this all come out when you were in grad school? And, and 
I understand you had to get special access to the Library of Congress to his papers. I'm just wondering how difficult that was, how the process of formulating the desire and the actual writing of the book. Sure. Well, like I said, I did not grow up wanting to be a historian or even really a writer. I always, of course, loved reading. I mean, that was what I enjoyed doing much more so than writing. But then you know, I, I I mentioned I watched Milk, and it was right around the time that I realized that that I was really enjoying history even more so than political science. Because anyone who's taken a political science class knows it's actually quite co- quantitative. It's a lot of numbers and and statistics, and that wasn't so much for me. I've always considered myself more of a storyteller, and. When I watched Milk and started thinking, oh, what? maybe I'll start writing about this. And I was in the middle of a, of a history research seminar that the whole point was to teach you how to use archives. And I just happened to watch the movie with my first boyfriend at the time. And it was right at the moment, total coincidence that I needed to pick a topic. And I said, you know what? Let me see what, what other names are out there. What other th- stories need to be told? And I literally looked up on the university library database, Harvey Milk, and one of the related topics was the name you just mentioned, Franklin E. Kameny. And I think the only information I was able to find uh, about him on that first day was maybe a a two-sentence Wikipedia page that basically said exactly what you just said, that he is considered one of the grandfathers of of the gay rights movement, at least as regarded by, by queer historians. And I said, well, if that's true, and you know, I've been out maybe a year and I am studying American history or considering doing that, how have I not heard of this guy? And I noticed that, as you mentioned, he had unfortunately passed away just a couple years prior. This was around 2013 and he passed away in 2011. And he had donated prior to his death hundreds of thousands of pages of his personal papers to the Library of Congress. And Fortunately, it isn't difficult. Anyone can get a, a library card to the Library of Congress. It's very easy. You just walk in. You say, I want to I want to research a card. And they take your picture and you get a, a fancy little card. And you get to go to the manuscripts room and you can hold, as I did my first day there, in your hands, the dress code for the first ever gay rights protest in front of the White House. You don't even have to wear gloves. You can just pick it up and touch it and see it with your own eyes. And that was my first time in an archive. And as I like to say, the rest is history. That was 10 years ago. I mean, I was hooked. And I think that was really the moment that it all clicked for me that that studying history, being a historian, is not memorizing dates and names and places and facts, um, as we're, we're uh, led to believe in, in high school because of some of these somewhat ridiculous uh, uh, curricula. And, and, and bad teachers. Sure. But, you know, I will say, you know, I had some of the most incredible teachers ever. I went to a, a great magnet public school. And, you know, I know that at the end of the day, we had to take a test, right? An advanced placement test or you know, whatever state other tests that there were. And they didn't have a choice, right? And so they did, They really were doing the best they could. But yes, of course, there are also teachers who can't even do that, right? But I was very lucky to have wonderful teachers. And, you know, at the end of the day, I still was having to memorize all these states and names. And that's not what being a historian is. And I think, of course, you know, knowing some of the basics and being tested on it isn't, isn't the worst thing. But I think it's, it's crucial that, that students in high school and even later understand that to study history is unearthing new knowledge, which we, we touched on before this conversation. It's, it's finding information that has been hidden or concealed or otherwise erased, um, whether it's in an archive or before it was in an archive, this was all in Frank Kameny's attic. It was about to be thrown away, except for some wonderful activists and friends of Frank uh, saved them and donated them to the Library of Congress. And without historians, we would not know the full story of the Mattachine Society or the the homophile movement, the pre-Stonewall gay rights movement, as it was called. And so I think being in the archive and realizing, oh my gosh, no one else in the world, um, or maybe like three or four other people in the world, has touched this paper. 
um, at least at the time. It was brand new, even though it was 50 years old, <laughs> right? That is the the most amazing feeling, and it was that that I got that I got hooked to. Well, there there are was, two axioms uh, that, that are related to history. One is that those who don't understand the past are condemned to repeat it. I forget who said that. Maybe you remember. Um, and the other one is, of course, those who control power, those who are in leadership roles, write history. So we mm -hmm. and we, as a stigmatized minority, have always been shut out. Our stories weren't mm -hmm. told. And it's only now that we're beginning to have the opportunity to go uncover them before people die, before their, their effects get thrown away, as, as you described. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Churchill. Churchill said one of those. I think it was the first. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how did you persuade? Well, I mean, let's, first of all, you wrote the manuscript for what became your book as your doc doctoral dissertation. Isn't that correct? Essentially, yeah. And, and to answer the rest of your your last question, you know, I I even writing my that first essay, it started as an essay in that class, and then I wrote a senior thesis in undergrad, and that was kind of an outgrowth of of that first essay. And at each point after finishing college, and then finishing my master's, and then finishing my PhD, it was never oh I have this grand plan to become this queer historian who you know makes a career out of this it was always I have stumbled upon this story that very few other people know and certainly the the depth of which it probably died along with Frank Kameny um, it was really held in his papers in the Library of Congress and I think with that knowledge and that that story comes responsibility to share it and to teach others what the lessons what i learned myself in in writing it and i think unfortunately academia so much of it is of of what people learn or unearth or discover is hidden behind a paywall behind you know uh university resources you have to have a library subscription you have to have an academic journal subscription in order to access this incredible production of knowledge and for me after after discovering these stories and especially after interviewing these people many of whom were, were have passed away since i last interviewed them and and passed away before i i wrote the book especially those who passed away during the aids crisis who who were not able to tell their own stories, I could not in good conscience put down this story. I could not say, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go get an actual job or I'm going to go to law school as my mother hoped. I just couldn't do it. I had to create something out of it and share it. I wanted to just kind of shake all my gay friends by the shoulders and be like, look at our history. Look how amazing it is. And also look where we not just got things right, but got things wrong. And, you know, this was, like you said, it was 2020. It was right as things were getting really, really bad during the the, the Trump administration. How could I possibly, if, if I found something that could teach us how to protect ourselves and advance ourselves in a terrible time, I felt the obligation to, to, to share it and not to throw it away. So that's what kept me going. And so, of course, it created this kind of uh, existential crisis after I did it. I said, you know, oh, my gosh, like, am I supposed to go find another story now? And I realized, yeah, that is exactly what you're supposed to do. Was it much of a challenge to take what was initially an academic treatise and make it accessible to a non-academic audience? And how did you persuade a publisher that a book about queer history would, in fact, be saleable? Mm. Very difficult. <laughs> in all of those senses, <laughs> because first of all, I knew that I didn't want to be a professor, but I knew that I wanted to publish this book for as many people as possible to read it. So that meant publishing through a major publisher, ideally. So not going through the academic press process. But I also was, you know, 22 years old and had no way to, to support myself um, while working on this. And so fortunately, the PhD program in, in Cambridge, they, they took a chance on me. Uh, I got a scholarship that would allow me to work on both. And that was kind of the, the it was, I don't think of it as a trade-off. It was actually great because it forced me to think in an academic 
mindset and create two products. My, my PhD is different than my book. Uh, if you want to read the PhD, <laughs> most of it actually got put in the end notes of the book. The end notes of the book are two thirds as long as the book itself because a lot of the really rigorous academic analysis that most people would find boring, but I find thrilling and some other people find thrilling are, are in the end notes. So that's where it ended up. But I started by writing the manuscripts first and saying, what is the story of Frank Hamity and the people who influenced him and whom he influenced? And let me start with that story for the broadest audience first. And then what can we learn from that? And what I found was after writing that manuscript first, what hadn't really been written about before, at least within academia, was just how influential and important Frank Hamney was in the legal sense, in the legal battle for queer liberation. And so my, my PhD was actually called The Proud Plaintiff. It was not The Deviant's War. It was The Proud Plaintiff. It was about Frank Hamney and the Mattachine Society's relationship with the American Civil Liberties Union. So a, a bit different, but the reason why is because no one had really written about it yet. That was the real contribution to the academy. But what, even though that I think is important and people can learn a lot from it, what got me excited about writing period was the story yeah, uh, and the people and also what we can learn from it, but what we, in the broader sense, not just professors and, and grad students, but what we as activists, as queer folks out in the real world can learn from it. Well, the biggest takeaway I got, I knew who Frank Kennedy was and what he'd accomplished, but I didn't know all the minutia that you wrote about, but was is his single-minded focus for almost two decades to the exclusion of almost everything else, right? I mean, it's kind of like Steve Jobs, you know, or Jobs, you know, inventing the iPhone. I'm People are saying it can't be done. Why are you doing this? You know, think of more practical things. And he just, w he wouldn't let up. And thanks to him, while unfortunately he never saw the fruits of his labor, it, it really was the foundation for what came afterwards. Exactly. And, you know, fortunately, Frank did live to see- Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, uh, some, of, some of the effects of it, but I think- um, you know, he died in, in poverty. Yeah. He, you know, I said he donated his papers, but really he, he was paid by, uh, some activists and some organizers to, to, um, to, to give away his papers. They had them appraised and he survived uh, his last days on the money that he received by, by giving away his papers. So he really was living in, in, uh, destitution. And so he did sacrifice quite a lot for that single-minded focus. And I think there was also the negative side, not only the financially negative side of it, but also the politically negative side that because he was so single-minded and he, I would argue, failed to adapt to a new generation of activists, he got left behind. And so I think that's, there's a lesson in that too. That's not uncommon though, right? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So what, mm -hmm. you know, I had heard that the Deviant's War was the first queer history book in perhaps decades. Uh, since so, Randy Schultz. Since the yeah. Randy Schultz the, and the band played on? Yep. Uh, to appear in the New York Times bestseller list. Um, aside from the beautifully crafted writing and the important story, why do you think this accomplishment was possible now? I think, you know, we were, were so often told that history is boring, that, you know, we're all indoctrinated in, in high school to, to assume that history, like I said, is just memorizing dates and, and names. And what I made sure of was in, in the positioning and the marketing of the book is that this is a story, a dramatic story about a real human being who is one of the grandfathers of the gay rights movement that every single queer person should know about. And if you market any story like that of this is the, the the secret history or this is you know the story that we all should know and can learn from then of course you're going to sell because guess what there's very few people doing that <laughs> there are not that many people out there writing queer history and that's unfortunate i hope that changes and it is changing there have been a lot more 
uh, queer history books written in, and some of them have made it on the list since since mine came out. You know, I, uh, I'm going to push back a little bit, although it may not be an apples to apples comparison, uh, but just for the sake of academic uh, debate, you know, in a different realm, the film Bros, right? Which recently came out in the first yeah. first mainstream gay rom com, they marketed it on that basis in a similar way to marketing this as a story that mm. would that was unique and revolutionary, and it didn't do as well as expected. There are a lot of differences in books and movies and history versus fiction, but I think they made a mistake in appealing to the better. I don't know what the right word, the better side of the broader population to go look at a gay film for the first time when they would have been more successful if they'd uh, focused on Judd Apatow, who's got this amazing track record of funny comedies, the fact that it was his vehicle. But so I'm saying I don't think always focusing on the story and the revolutionary nature of it is enough. Maybe I, it, it may be more that we're at this time when the stuff is going on with Trump and the, our liberties are under under threat that you're in effect bringing to people's attention the fact that this could happen again right and and yeah i know i think that's a good point um about bros but also you know fortunately books are very easy to acquire um even during covid you know there were huge supply chain issues that prevented people from from getting the book but it was still available on kindle still available on audiobook and fortunately, um, love them or hate them, you know, people get it the next day on Amazon, right. right? Whereas, you know, I think with Bros, it was it was unfortunate because I think they, if you look at all the rom coms that came out this year, it was number two of Seriously? all the rom coms. Oh wow! All the rom coms <laughs> that came out in theaters, it was number two. A gay rom com with Billy Eichner, right? So that suggests that, okay, well, maybe, maybe the marketing, <laughs> sure, expectations management, but also, you know, when you have it, it, the vast majority of people have some sort of streaming uh, 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 platform on their TV in their living room, and they literally just press a button to watch something versus having to go to a theater to do that. And then on top of that, you add in going to a theater in perhaps a place where you are not fully out. Right. Right. That is something to keep in mind. Absolutely. What does it mean if you're in Round Rock, Texas, where I'm from, and you're seen walking into bros by yourself, even if you're a straight person, even if you're a straight woman, what does that mean? And I think, you know, unfortunately, the creatives don't get to decide how a, a film is marketed. I've, I've learned that in a hard way through through being with from Hollywood. You know, you make a movie and then it gets handed off to the studio or or the distributor, the experts. and they make all those decisions. Exactly, they make all those decisions. So, you know, I think uh, fortunately the movie itself now it is available on streaming and it's it's doing great. Right? It's right. it's it's probably going to win awards. Um, in fact, I think it was nominated for a Golden Globe. I got to check. So. The huge success of Deviant's War has led to at least two other opportunities for you that I'm aware of. Uh, you were creating a creator and executive producer of The Book of Queer, a humorous yet educational discovery channel program focusing on five chapters, five LGTB stories in history. And if I understand correctly, I don't know where this is going, but are you still working on a serialization of Deviant's War for Amazon? We are. In fact, we have uh, uh, a meeting about it almost right after <laughs> this meeting, which is why I have that that uh, uh, a very stringent uh, calendar and assistant uh, who makes sure that I don't forget the, these these meetings. But yeah, it's it's happening and um, what's the time we're, we're working on it. What's the timetable for that? Oh, God knows. I've learned that that with Hollywood, yeah. um, you know, fortunately with 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 publishing, it's almost always from the outset, you know exactly when it's at least planned to come out. But right. with with Hollywood, it could change on a on a on a, on a dime. What else so I being, don't want to make it. What else is being released at the same time? When's the open window? I, yeah, I get it. So exactly. How has the experience been for you working on film and TV as opposed to writing a book? And what are the main takeaways you can share with us from those experiences? Do you have a preference for one or the other medium? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's very different. And I don't think I anticipated how how different it would be, specifically because, you know, a, a book 
you write that on your own. You know, maybe one or two other people will see it. You'll have your editor and then maybe a few other execs and copy editors and stuff like that. Unless you have a really, you know, differences with with your your editor, they're not going to say no. They're not going to say you cannot write that because at the end of the day, it's it's your book. Right. It's your artistic creation. Whereas in Hollywood, it's the exact opposite. I mean, every single decision has to be approved by the people who are financing it. Uh, so not only do you have to convince the rest of the creative team, the production company, um, the execs within the production company, the other producers, the other writers, you also have to persuade whoever is paying for it, which is usually the streamer or uh, the network, that, you know, we want this person to narrate it. They have to say yes or no. Um, we want this actor, this cast, they have to say yes or no. We want to tell these stories. They say yes or no. And I think that was something that was really eye-opening for me because I didn't realize how constrained creators were, especially when it comes to to scripted material. You know, if if you're annoyed that that something gets cut from an adaptation of of a book, chances are it wasn't the creative. It was probably the network that said, you know, we can't include that right? Even the casting. Very often it's, it's especially in queer roles, um, when it's a straight actor, very often that's the network or the streamer mandating that. And of course the creatives want that authenticity the vast majority of the time, but then it gets vetoed. And, you know, I could give example after example, but I can't, but, I won't. But it's become but, an even more politicized factor today, right? When there's this whole call for authentic representation versus celebrities, you know, well-known straight celebrities playing queer or trans roles, right? Exactly. And I think that's why we as consumers have actually more power, I would argue, than, than a lot of folks within the industry, or at least the creatives, because we're representative of the bottom line, right? We are decisions of what we watch, you know, whether it's watching, do we watch bros or do we watch something with James Corden <laughs> playing a queer character, right? We do have that power to indicate what's acceptable on a cultural and political level by how we spend our money or what we decide to watch. Before I move on from what you've done previously to what you're doing now, you know, I, I had heard from inside sources that you did an awful lot of work to help promote your own book. And that contributed he heavily to it being the first queer book in a long time to be on the New York Times bestseller list. What can an author do to help that process along? Well, I told my my agent that it was my goal to get on on the bestseller list, and he said, "You know that is going to be very very difficult because the way it works is you have to hit say maybe." 5,000 books sold in a single week in order to make it. But the problem is, if your publisher only prints 2,000 books, it is physically impossible to do that. And so I thought, well, okay, how do we persuade the publisher to print more books so it is physically possible? And the way we did that was through pre-orders and encouraging folks to to pre-order the book. Um, and that sent a signal to the publisher. Oh, my gosh. We, you know, clearly Eric has stumbled on something. There are all these orders coming in. We better print more books. And that's exactly what they did. And because of that early indicator of demand, they also put more resources into marketing. Um, but on the flip side, you know, we and I had this huge plan to do a, a I think, a 12 city book tour with uh, it was going to be in conversation with drag queens at gay bars in all these different cities. And then COVID oh. happened. <laughs> My editor got fired. My publicist got fired. And there were supply chain issues. No, you could not buy my my book in a single independent bookstore in the country. You just couldn't do it. Um, and this was also in the middle of the lockdown. Um, and so I was on my own 
uh, when it came to to publicizing the book. And I ended up putting together uh, 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 with the support of of my publisher, I should say, they were so incredibly supportive at, at FSG, uh, putting together a virtual book tour. And this was before th- it was really common to be doing that. So fortunately, they they let me kind of uh, plan in. I had a whole bunch of friends on Brian Sims from Philly, uh, Richie Jackson, um, Alok, the incredible activist also from Texas, took part in it. And I was get I got to be in conversation with them. And it also showed me the silver lining of the lockdown, but also our new virtual world is I would not have been able to be in conversation with some of these incredible folks. Angina from season one of of Drag Race. I had I was in conversation with her uh, via Zoom. People from all over the world were able to attend. Um, and and now most of the events that I do, even though COVID is you know quote unquote over, are are virtual. And I would say often I prefer it because it just allows for so many more people. Yeah, it's, to, it's to expanded be our reach in ways we never would have been forced to deal with before. Totally. So you know to have accomplished. I mean, are you thirty one yet? <laughs> Almost. Okay. In, in April. <laughs> so to have accomplished all that you have by the age of thirty is a remarkable feat. Uh, and thank yet you. <laughs> it's and exhausting. They're working on various other content streams, delivering gay history through multiple channels, and burnishing your queer activist credentials at the same time. And so rather than have me list some of the things that I'm aware of, and I am frankly I think I produce a lot of content and I look at all the stuff that I see and I'm sure there are things that I don't see that you're doing and I I wonder how do you do it? So, and I'm thinking in particular of the most recent thing that is least very known is the Rainbow Book Bus Bus Mm Initiative. So, would you just kind of describe for us a few of the most important things you feel, you know, that you're working (laughs) on and, and, and where you want them to go? Some troll online once referred to me as exhausting, and I could <laughs> not agree more. It is it, it is exhausting, but you know, I I think the political climate of today has just solidified how important what all queer historians do is. Uh, to answer your question, my my partner Adam and I. Uh, is not just my partner in life, but also my partner in business. He just quit his, his full-time job, uh, his big corporate job to start a queer bookshop with me because I think if there's anything I've learned is I wish that I had access in high school and even before then to some of the literature that has taught me not just about myself, but about the full vibrancy, diversity of our community. Um, The best way to learn about what it means to be lesbian or a person of color or trans rather than, you know, asking someone to, uh, to explain it to you, which is, which is also exhausting for that other person by reading and supporting them both financially um, and supporting them by furthering their mission, that is the best way that you can support so many different activists, so many different creators, is by reading their books. And one thing that I learned or from the publication of my own book was how little our authors are paid, right? If you buy a book for $20 on Amazon, the author gets $2, if that, that's if they earn out their advance, they get $2. Amazon themselves gets $10. They get five times more what an author makes. And that's true for any retailer, wherever you get a book. And I think that's pretty messed up, especially given how much work, you know, as you mentioned, I was doing to, to sell my own book, not to mention writing the book. <laughs> you know, why is it that this, this warehouse is getting five times more than the creator of this product? And so my partner and I created a bookshop. It's called shopqueer.co that splits its profits with authors. And so... Over 150 authors have signed editions of their books because every single month we pay them out a portion of our uh, proceeds, which is logistically, as you guessed, very difficult. And we're having our, to create our own warehouse in our in our garage, and it's it's really 
really hard. Anyone out there who is in retail or in uh, or any kind of small business, God bless you, because this this stuff is much harder, I would argue, than than writing a book. So I'm learning a lot, making a lot of mistakes, but it's fun. And it's just it's so cool to see other people read um, not just my book, but you know, the thousands of books that we have available. I want to know how you even find time to read all the books that you're it, it seems like you have, maybe you haven't, but, uh, Oh, definitely not. Okay. Oh, definitely not. I mean, at least, I mean, we have 2000 books right. on the website, oh, so wow. there's just, there's, <laughs> there is no way. And, you know, fortunately I have to read a lot of the books that I feature, you know, I have my book club, right. I do my queer history 101 and, you know, I say, okay, well, if that's my job, it's like kind of, that's kind of the best job in the world, right? right? right. And to, <laughs> to be able to read a book and then be in conversation with the author and then talk to, you know, other readers and be in conversation is the best job in the world. It's really hard, not profitable, but <laughs> it's well, really fun. I find the impact of that from the standpoint of helping the authors and getting stories out amazing. But, and again, as much as I understand of it, I find the goal of the Rainbow Book Bus Initiative is even more compelling. Do you want to kind of describe mm -hmm. what that is? Sure. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. So, of course, because we are operating our bookshop out of our apartment and out of our garage right now. And we probably would not be able to afford a, a brick and mortar location for a while. But the silver lining of that is we're planning to do what same thing restaurants do when they can't afford a physical location, which is instead of a food truck, we're going to do a book bus, a bookmobile. And the the perks of it being mobile is we we plan on taking it on tour. Very similar to how, you know, if anyone remembers scholastic book fairs at their schools where, you know, one day a year you get to uh, have your library taken over by by new books and um, you get to kind of explore all these different worlds. We want to do that, except likely partnering with LGBT centers and allow it to be a, a fundraiser for a lot of these centers that provide crucial, often life saving support to their communities, especially in rural areas. We want to go not just spread literature, uh, but also support some of these these centers that are doing just incredible work. I, my understanding is, and I may be confused how this all fits together, that your aim is also to get the availability of these books, whether physical copies or digital, out there, particularly to schools and counties and locations that are finding themselves subject to things like the Don't Say Gay bill in, in Florida. How, exactly. how are you going to be able to to reach them and how are you doing that well we're planning on showing up in a big bus adam will probably be in drag uh we'll we'll and showing up to to some of these places that are banning these queer books and and, and throwing a book fair of our own i mean we're gonna have to partner of course with some some hosts and some lgbt centers to make sure that everything is is done safely and and um do you think you'll it's run inclusive. Any, any risk of arrest in places like that uh probably <laughs> you know especially if if we're around schools, I'm sure there will be protesters. I'm sure there's going to be some scary moments. But you know what? You look, I'm a historian. Right. You look at what the Freedom Riders did, what uh, activists in the Black Freedom Movement did in the South. That was a lot scarier. Right. You know, showing up with a drag queen, you know, and, and maybe a film crew or something is going to be a lot less scary than than what others have, have been through. So oh, I just remind oh, I myself know. that. We're, we're seeing some of these violent, anti-gay people showing up at some of these things so i mean again hopefully that doesn't happen but you know please be careful whatever whatever you do um thank you if if we had to step back for a moment obviously you never expected to be here as recently as five years ago if you could project ahead 20 or 30 years where do you hope to be what do you hope the impact of all that you're doing will have been Ooh, well Maybe there will be a second book. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if it ever happens. I think, you know, the real dream is I want a fleet of these book buses. I want, you know, queer literature to be uh, available and accessible to the entire country and also to the entire world. I mean, imagine it's difficult enough to, to read a queer book and support queer authors in Florida. Imagine how hard it is in other parts of the world. And, and books transcend borders. They transcend stories, transcend all divides, and they erase those borders actively. And so I think 
trying to make our stories and our lives more accessible to people and show who we are and remind people of our own humanity and of our beauty uh, is, is what I hope to do for the rest of my life. It sounds like in some ways, while we're coming at it from slightly different angles, we both have the aspiration to help create a larger family globally, a, a, a true community that that transcends language, culture, national borders, etc. Because whether you're in Bangladesh or you're in Brooklyn, your aspirations are to be able to be who you are and have friends and be open about it. Obviously, there are places both in our own country and abroad where you can't be. But if we can get these stories to them, we get them that much closer to being able to be themselves. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been amazing as I knew it would be. I wish you the best of luck on everything you're doing. Um, you've turned me on to a number of books I wouldn't have known of, known of otherwise, and I appreciate that. And just knowing you and being a friend uh, has been important over the last couple of years. Good luck with everything. Likewise. Okay, good luck with everything. Thank you so much. It's an honor, and, and thank you again for having me. The podcast you've been listening to is produced by Mike Balaban and Tom Walker, recorded and researched by Mike Balaban, with editing and music from Henry Leigh.